She was an ambitious young woman living a life of adventure. There were so many places on her wish list that she wanted to go to. Paris, Rome, Budapest. She was an incredibly hard worker and she worked extra long hours to get time off to travel. Until her work ethic put her in the wrong place at the wrong time. There are drag marks, blood stains on the floor, blood on the lift. It was an awful scene. But had it been a tragic happenstance or a terrifying act of revenge? It's hard to imagine anyone doing something so brutal. We live in a world dominated by hatred, evil and money. Saturday, January 13th, 2007, London, England. Around 9.30 p.m., police respond to an emergency call on South Lambeth Road near the River Thames. The address turns out to be an office building. Officers are led in by two young people, a man and a woman, both of whom seem very frightened and upset. There'd been clearly a, a significant struggle in the foyer of the premises. There's obvious blood stains on the floor, damage to the wall in the form of plaster, and also damage to uh, a piece of door, plinth, or wooden part. They followed where the blood went, and it went down to a shower at the end of a corridor. Inside, the officers find the dead body of a young woman. There's the victim lying essentially upside down, buttocks towards the front of the shower and a right leg upwards and her head turned to the left. Her own coat is covering the body. It was an awful scene, this young woman, um, who'd been clearly um, badly beaten um, and she'd been strangled with her own scarf. The two callers identify the victim as their friend, 28-year-old Catherine Marlowe. Catherine is very well-liked, a model employee, nobody can work out who would want to hurt her. Catherine Marlowe was born and raised half a world away in Hawke's Bay, New Zealand. For Catherine and her two siblings, it meant not only did they have all of that wonderful countryside as a playground, they also had access to some of the finest public schools in the country. Kathy did very well academically as well as socially. She was sweet, fun-loving, and could light up any room with her smile. Extended illnesses made it difficult for Kathy to complete her graduation requirements. So in 1995, she decided to enter the workforce instead. She spent a couple of years doing office jobs like receptionist or typist by day and doing part-time pub jobs at night. By all accounts, she was well-loved by her colleagues at every job she had, but she wanted more out of life. She soon wanted to be a bit more stretched, so she ended up uh, studying uh, accounting. In April of 2001, Kathy was hired to work at an accounting firm in New Zealand. In every performance review, she would ask for more challenges. She wanted to try something new, and she soon climbed the ladder as an accounting technician. Kathy was, you know, she was quite a driven person. She had a lot of goals. One of her goals was to see the world. She began saving up for her overseas experience, or her OE. Now, this was something she was not only excited about, she knew it would look good on her resume when she returned home to New Zealand. What New Zealanders and, and Australians call the big overseas experience, so travelling around the world, really, backpacking around the world. She decided she was going to live and reside in London for a number of years and use that as a base to explore Europe uh, and other areas. Kathy's family were very proud of her and supported her decision. It was time for her to get out there on her own. In April of 2004, Kathy boarded a plane for the United Kingdom. Kathy found work in the South London borough of Lambeth as a finance manager for a company called Research Now. 
She lived with a friend in nearby Vauxhall. She had an accountancy role there and she enjoyed working there and she was very dedicated and, and well thought of by her colleagues. And her new employer provided her enough freedom to pursue her dream of traveling. Almost as soon as she was here, she was traveling around Europe. There were so many places on her wish list that she wanted to go to. She went to Paris, Rome, Budapest. Later, she went to the island of Mykonos in Greece. She absolutely loved traveling. Kathy had been working at Research Now for over a year, when in January of 2007, when Kathy got the opportunity to visit Egypt, she didn't hesitate for a moment. She worked extra hours to save up the days off work. It wasn't a problem for her employer. Kathy was extremely conscientious about her work. Some said, you know, she was on the point of being a workaholic. So much so that when she went on holiday to Egypt, she sort of fell behind with her work a bit. Kathy returned home on Friday, January 12th, through the form. She told friends and family that she was going into the office for a few hours to catch up on emails that Saturday. It would be the last time her family would hear from her. After her spur of the moment vacation, 28 year old Catherine Marlowe has been found beaten and strangled to death in an office bathroom the shower cubicle area, which is a part of the ground floor which very few people used. And I think it was sort of designed for cyclists and people who needed a shower when they got to work. It was very rarely used, but that's where Kathy's body was. There was no question she'd been brutally murdered. The question was, who did it and why? Coming up. The crime scene points to a disturbing scenario. There was evidence of a cleanup operation and a smell of bleach. London police are investigating the death of 28 year old financier Catherine Marlowe, who was found beaten and strangled at her place of work. Research now was in a very busy area of central London called Vauxhall. There was a tube station, bus station, train stations, lots of people, and they found Kathy on the ground floor, murdered in a shower unit. There's a scarf tightly bound around the neck, and from the intense congestion of the face and what we call petechiae, which are little dot hemorrhages, and uh, refer to ruptured small blood vessels, it's obvious that she's died as a result of uh, strangulation by ligature. There are also other obvious injuries. She'd had a number of blows, cuts to the head, which had caused blood to go everywhere. One of the first things they noticed that was whoever killed her had already tried to get rid of evidence and then for some reason stopped. There was evidence of a clean-up operation and a smell of bleach. There's a lot of tissues on the body. They were used, I think, just to clear up blood. It seemed the killers decided there was too much to get rid of or something spooked them before they finished. Closer inspection of the body reveals that the 28-year-old tried to fight off her attackers. She's got a defense-type injury on her hand, a fractured metacarpal bone, which is a long bone in the hand. And the reason she's got that is that undoubtedly she's put her hand forward, probably over her head, to protect herself. It's also obvious the initial struggle didn't happen in the shower. They found blood splatter in the reception area, as well as damage to the wall, and a partial fingerprint, presumably from whoever attacked her. There was drag marks in blood, so on first glance, the victim had been dragged along that corridor leading to the shower block. So all this fits into a pattern of a fight, unconscious or semi-conscious, and then dragged and dumped. Forensic specialists began processing the crime scene for anything that might help identify Kathy's attackers. With such a struggle, there's likely to be the victim's blood, but equally, you know, the question arises as to whether the suspects left any trace evidence of blood and DNA at the scene. There was um, a lot of blood that could be analysed, um, hairs that could be analysed, and the whole area was scoured for any possible pieces of evidence. We took the decision to examine the whole of the building. Quite a complex uh, forensic scene. 
In the meantime, detectives turned their attention to the two friends who'd called police. Rachel Warren was a friend of the victims and they shared a flat together very locally to where Kathy worked, about a 10 minute walk. Rachel was emotional and very upset about finding her best friend in this state, but she indicated to police that she wanted to help in any way she could. She was able to tell us that Kathy had left home uh, that morning at about nine o'clock, and from that we were able to trace the owner of a coffee shop that served her coffee at about ten past nine, just before she went into the building. She was you know, planning to do a bit of work in the morning in the office, and she had actually phoned her friend about 1.30 p.m., saying she was about to leave the office and go and meet her. The plan was that they'd meet in the coffee shop about 15 minutes later, but unfortunately, she never arrived. It was very out of character for Cathy to not meet an appointment. There was no sign of her, and she was not answering her phone. After a few hours, Rachel tells police that she called a co-worker of Cathy's named Simon. Rachel went through Kathy's itemized phone bill and she found Simon Edwards, who she knew worked with Kathy at Research Now. So she rang him and uh, he agreed to meet Rachel at the office. That was the last place Rachel knew she'd been, but no one was there and she didn't have a key. She said Simon had told her to meet her at Research Now at 9 p.m. They went up to the third floor, which is where Kathy worked, but she wasn't there. She wasn't at her desk, and they sort of looked around and eventually came down to the ground floor. That's when they saw the trail of blood. Simon apparently told Rachel to stay there while he followed the trail of blood down the hall. She suddenly heard this yelling from Simon. She could tell from his voice that he'd found Kathy, probably not in her worst dreams did she think that Kathy would actually be dead but that's what Simon had found Rachel says they didn't see anyone else in the building and she can't imagine who might want to hurt someone like Kathy Kathy you know had been enjoying her life in London uh, she didn't have any enemies that she knew about she didn't have any sort of embittered boyfriends who'd uh, had any sort of grudge or motive to kill her. At that point, there's not a lot to go on. She could have simply been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Except the way she was killed showed a lot of rage. So that meant it was probably someone who knew her. Coming up, investigators question a witness's motives. These actions were perhaps overly helpful. It's been several hours since two of Catherine Marlowe's friends found her body in an office bathroom. And investigators are searching for clues to explain this senseless murder. We had in excess of a hundred uh, forensic uh, examiners in the building. While that's going on, detectives are busy talking to Kathy's friends, Rachel and Simon. Rachel was able to give us a pen picture of Kathy, her personality, uh, her traits, her social life. Rachel said she was dating, but she had no significant other at the time. Unfortunately, nothing Rachel told the police gave them any insight or any leads as to what might have happened. Simon isn't able to give detectives much to go on either. He said he'd gone to the, the murder scene, as we now know it, with Rachel to try and find Kathy's whereabouts, to try and hopefully find her safe and well. That wasn't to be the case. He basically confirmed everything Rachel had told them and said he hadn't seen Kathy for several weeks. He previously worked with her there, but it wasn't like they were especially close. Simon Edwards worked with Kathy, you know, only a few desks away from her. You know, they were friends, went out for a drink uh, after work occasionally with the rest of the workmates. You know, there was no real indication that there had any, ever been any sort of romantic relationship between the two of them. They were just, you know, work colleagues. But investigators can't be certain that either of them are being completely truthful. The main thing is that Simon is covered in Kathy's blood. 
Now, it may be because he was the one who found her, but Rachel said Simon had told her to stay behind. Was it out of concern for Rachel's well-being, or did he have an ulterior motive? Other officers who had been called to the scene before I took over the investigation had decided that his actions were perhaps overly helpful. They became suspicious of him as a character. As a senior investigator investigating homicides, often you're presented with red herrings. It's really important that you build a reasonable hypothesis of what's happened, but you avoid confirmation bias. So we, we clearly we interviewed him at length. Investigators decide to collect a sample of Simon's DNA before releasing him. Simon Edwards was interviewed at length. Alibi information was taken and forensic samples were taken. Uh, and in due course, he was completely exonerated. There was no element of him being involved in this at all. Meanwhile, the forensics team continues their work. They've treated the whole scene with luminol, which is a substance that shows up blood under fluorescence. When I get to the scene, there's obvious blood stains uh, on the floor, including a print mark. There's blood on the lift, and blood was found on all three floors, particularly on the top floor, under a desk. That meant the murderer had gone upstairs after Cathy's murder. The question was, why? The police obviously liaised closely with the managing director, etc., and asked them whether anything looked different or whatever. And it was then that they realised that six laptops had gone missing. Those computers seemed like they were the only things that were taken, and there were no signs of forced entry. So it looked like whoever did this might have come looking for them. Unfortunately, the building does not have CCTV cameras installed, so detectives must find another way to identify the killer. We sat down with experts and uh, considered the importance of each item that we'd seized, and in due course they were submitted to the laboratory for examination. All they can really hope is that an autopsy or DNA test will produce a lead. But at least now, they have a possible motive. It appeared Cathy might have interrupted a robbery and have been killed to prevent her identifying whoever it was. In fact, she might even have been used to gain entry into the building, so detectives widened the search. London is uh, rich in terms of CCTV coverage. We decided we were going to take CCTV from the uh, immediate vicinity to see if that would give us any clues. Police had Rachel's timeline of when Cathy left their flat, and they also had her starting and ending points. So police pulled footage from cameras all along her route. They were able to build up that chronology of when she'd left home when she'd been to the patisserie, when she'd got to work, and fit that in with the phone calls she'd made. Investigators pour over the surveillance footage until they finally spot Kathy outside the coffee shop around 9 a.m. We spoke with the coffee shop owner who'd served Kathy. Kathy was a regular visitor there. She seemed very happy enough. There was no suspicion at that point that she was under any sort of threat. But that footage from the coffee shop was the last visible evidence of her being alive. Kathy was working alone in research now in her office block, but we do know that she used her swipe card to gain access to her office on the third floor of the building at about quarter past nine. However, detectives do spot something else on the recording. While it didn't identify any of the subjects, it did identify that she was carrying a very distinctive handbag. We couldn't find the handbag with her body or in the confines of the building. So we were concerned that it had been stolen as a consequence of the, the offence taking place. The police put out an appeal in relation to the bag to see if any members of the public could help them. It's potentially a big break if someone found the bag or a shop owner remembers one of her credit cards being used. That gets them one step closer to making an identification. Coming up, an ATM transaction gives investigators their first look at a potential suspect. Someone's tried to use a card, which has then produced an image.
Several days into the January 2007 murder investigation of 28-year-old Kathy Marlowe, closed-circuit camera footage has given London detectives their first lead. We know Kathy had a handbag with her when she went for coffee in the morning. We couldn't find the handbag subsequently, and that became a key point of appeal for information by the investigation. They don't have to wait long for the lead to pay off. We were contacted by the bank to say that someone's tried to use her card, which had then produced an image of the suspect. We circulated that image to local police, and two separate officers came forward with the same name. He was due a local magistrate's court that morning for uh, another criminal matter. On the 17th of January, Daniel Kennedy was in fact arrested for an offence of trying to use the card. And then the dilemma is, OK, is he just a petty thief or is this the murderer? A police background check reveals that this isn't Daniel's first brush with the law. On the face of it, he was a petty thief with previous convictions for thefts. Daniel had no previous history of violence, and when detectives began questioning him, he insisted he had nothing to do with Kathy's murder. Daniel said he was with his girlfriend on Saturday, January 13th. They were walking down Vauxhall Street when they spotted the handbag. You or I might have tried to turn it in, but to a guy like that, it was an opportunity. He claimed he hadn't seen anyone leave it. He had no idea who Catherine Marlowe was and knew no one who worked at Research Now. He said uh, they decided to steal the handbag and they took it back to their home address, which was nearby. And then subsequently, Kennedy had tried to use Kathy Marlowe's bank card on an ATM machine. The attempt failed, so Daniel decided to ditch the purse. He told police it was probably still in the rubbish bin outside his house. All things considered, he was surprisingly cooperative with the investigation. He was just very quick to say, yeah, yeah, I was, I was trying to, you know, get some money, but I didn't kill her and I, I don't, didn't go in the building. So he was obviously panicking that he would uh, have this murder pinned on him. Daniel's story seems to check out. Kathy Marlowe's handbag was recovered from his home address. It contained Kathy's mobile phone, banking card and personal effects. It was anyone's guess whether there was any cash or valuables in the purse prior to it being found. The woman who had been with Daniel corroborates his statement, as do security cameras in the area. Around 3 p.m., you see them enter frame, and then you see them pause as they spot the handbag. And then one of them reaches down, picks it up, and then they walk out of frame with it. When police rewind the footage, they were unable to spot who had dropped it there. With Daniel cleared, investigators seemed to be back at square one. There was no immediate suspect forthcoming. We took a decision that we were going to try and eliminate all the current employees of Research Now and the other businesses within that office complex. My officers took witness statements from all those individuals, and we also took forensic samples from them so that we could implicate or eliminate their involvement when we harvested any suspect DNA from the scene. They had to go through and check every single employee's alibi. It was meticulous work that took hundreds of man hours. We then started to look at known office burglars in the locality and in London, and this generated a significant amount of suspects. And where do you start with that? How are you going to eliminate or implicate one of hundreds of burglars being involved in this particular offence. We, we were really struggling in the initial stages. But investigators are about to finally catch a break. We get a phone call from the crime scene manager and we've got a, a, a hit on the DNA. We've got the profile. Kathy Marlowe put up such a struggle. There was blood supported by DNA under her fingernails. She'd also managed to rip out some of her murderer's hair and the DNA from that matched the blood under her fingernails. I was asked whether I wanted to run that uh, on the DNA database as a, as, a, as a search. Of course, I said yes straight away. Shortly thereafter, I had a call back to say, we've identified somebody called Matthew Fagan, an American guy living in London. He once been arrested for being drunk and disorderly, and at that point, his DNA was taken. That was enough to give uh, the police the breakthrough that they needed. 
Coming up, investigators discover a link between the suspect and the victim. He had quite a chip on his shoulder, quite a grudge against the company. Two weeks after the investigation into Catherine Marlowe's murder first began, detectives finally believe they know who did it. A 31-year-old American named Matthew Fagan. He'd been arrested uh, a year or two previously for a minor drunken offence in Covent Garden in central London. This was the first time police had ever heard the name. Matthew wasn't on the list of employees at Research Now or any of the other businesses in the building. So they immediately started a background check. Matthew Fagan was uh, quite an interesting character. Kathy, uh, she'd come from New Zealand to live in London, and Matthew Fagan had come from a, a long way away as well. He'd uh, grown up in Oregon, in a small logging town called White Salmon. He seemed to have had a happy enough childhood, but overall there was nothing that really stood out about him. In 2000, he suddenly got a work visa to come and work in London as a web production manager. And that was the job he was doing for research now. Like Cathy, he also wanted to travel the world, but he ended up falling in love. He'd married in 2003, married a, a German woman called Vanessa. Unlike Cathy, however, Matthew's work ethic didn't seem to match his ambition. Fagan was viewed by a number of his colleagues and his managers as, as being an unreliable, a compulsive liar. He, by the sound of it, was not very good at his job. He was described as lazy and, uh, you know, eventually it caught up on him. He'd been sacked for incompetence in April 2006. Nine months before Kathy's murder, which is why he hadn't shown up on the list of current employees. Kathy didn't play any part in, in his being uh, dismissed. There was no great evidence that uh, they were friends or enemies. They had sat next to each other at work, but, but hadn't had any relationship of any sort. But was he seeking revenge against his former employer? They left uh, research now under quite a cloud and in quite acrimonious circumstances. They were not prepared to give him a reference or certainly not a good reference. He had quite a chip on his shoulder, quite a grudge against the company. Matthew had fallen into dire financial straits and he blamed it all on research now. Fagan got fired in April 2006. His life sort of began to spiral out of control by the sound of it. Apparently he was sort of heavily leaning on Vanessa for money. He got some work working for a removals firm, but then he was basically doing burglaries on the side. And what better place to rob than a former employer who put you in that position. We think the motive for the offence was initially burglary, so he was going to the property to research now, figuring that no one would be at work on a Saturday to burgle the premises and to steal the laptops and, and computers. Not only would it mean a bit of money, but he'd also be taking revenge on the people who'd ruined his life. Well, because she was so diligent, Kathy had gone in on a Saturday to catch up on her work. More than two weeks after the death of Kathy Marlowe, detectives finally have enough to make an arrest. And fortunately, Matthew isn't very hard to find. This was a highly publicized case, and he was an American citizen. You'd think he'd try to flee the country, but he didn't turn out to be very smart. On the 28th of January 2007, Matthew Fagan was arrested at his home address. He was taken to Southwark Police Station in central London and he was interviewed at length. He's continuously exercised his qualified right to make no comment. So, in essence, he was denying involvement in the offence. Matthew's attempts to stonewall police immediately stop once he's formally charged with murder. It was at that point he gave us a statement under caution in which he admitted having been involved in a burglary. His position was that when he left there, Kathy Marlowe was uh, alive and well. He said he had some accomplices. He said they were Eastern European 
um, that he worked with them at the removals firm and that they sort of came with him uh, for, for burglaries. When Cathy Marlowe disturbed them, Fagan said that all he did was help to restrain her. He'd left the premises at that point. He'd never assaulted Cathy in any way. He said he had intended to steal computers from the company, but he left before taking a single thing. Fagan's story was that he had left Cathy with these two men, and that is the last he knew of it. So he was heavily inferring that, you know, one of them had killed her and not him. Investigators aren't buying it. If two other men were responsible for Kathy's death, why did they only find Matthew's hair and DNA at the crime scene? We were able to trace the other individuals that, that Fagin tried to implicate, and we were able to alibi them and say that they were nowhere near the location at the time the offence was committed. When London police issued a statement saying that Matthew Fagan had been indicted for the murder of Kathy Marlowe, it made all the headlines. Here was this charming, pretty young woman whose life had been ended for what? Six laptops? It was at that point somebody came forward having seen his name in, in the newspapers and in the media and said, look, I need to speak to you. The new witness claims Fagan approached him offering to sell some computers. Fagan said to him that he could sell him laptops for about £300 each. You know, the only place he could have possibly got these from was from his old workplace. The man said they agreed to meet, but when Matthew turned up for the exchange, he was pretty banged up. He had several bruises, cuts on his hand, and a bandage on his head. So he asked him what had happened. Matthew claimed that later that afternoon he himself was mugged and um, somebody came at him with a knife and that's how he got some sort of cuts to his hands. The story was obviously made up, but the guy didn't think much of it at the time. He was just there to buy the laptops, which he did, and he was able to provide enough information to tie the laptops back to the robbery. We established that indeed these computers had been stolen from research now, so clearly Fagan was lying. But would it be enough to convince a jury? It's quite a big step to go from the rather petty burglar, six laptops from a commercial premises, to being someone who murders a young woman. Coming up, prosecutors hope new evidence will finally bring a killer to justice. Detectives went back through footage they'd collected. They had no trouble spotting Matthew this time. In September of 2008, the trial of Matthew Fagan gets underway. He stands accused of murdering 28-year-old Catherine Marlowe two years earlier. Matthew claims two other men are responsible, but prosecutors argue the evidence proves otherwise. They had one of the best barristers, one of the best prosecutors in the country. He was leading their case, and, uh, you know, he just forensically went through Fagan's story and, and made it quite clear to the jury that there was no accomplices. It was simply Fagan on his own. And, you know, whatever happened to Cathy, there was only one man responsible for it. From the forensic examination we carried out, we could only find the involvement of one individual. It was only Fagan's DNA and blood that was found at the scene, which would indicate that he was involved in quite a significant struggle with the victim. Not only had Fagan's blood been found under Cathy's nails, but several other places as well, including the foyer where the struggle had taken place and on the third floor under the desks where the laptops had been stolen from. The man who bought the stolen computers testified that Matthew was the one who sold them to him. But new footage from CCTV cameras in the area provides the most damning evidence of all. Once Matthew was arrested, detectives went back through the hundreds of hours of footage that they'd got during the investigation. Knowing who they were looking for, they had no trouble spotting Matthew this time. We had footage of him leaving the scene wearing a rucksack with the computers in the back. 
He had a particular gait, a sort of semi-limp. It made it somewhat more easy to identify. They also knew Matthew had been injured in the struggle with Kathy, so they were able to get additional footage of him seeking treatment at a nearby hospital. Because of medical records and the like, it was easy to prove that that was him. Prosecutors describe Matthew as a man obsessed with getting back at the people who fired him, no matter the cost. He'd managed to keep his keys to the office when he was fired. At that point, he thought, well, I'll just use those keys, get back in, steal something, and they deserve it from his point of view. My interpretation from the scene and from her injuries were that she attended the office to do some work, um, that he discovered her on the ground floor, and then the assault started. He hit her over the head. There's sufficient to cause damage to her head and cause blood distribution, but not enough to kill her or make her unconscious. She's continued fighting. There's evidence that they've struck the wall on at least two areas. She's wearing a scarf, and he's used that scarf to strangle her. She's then come unconscious and dying, and he's dragged the body and placed it in the shower. We never found an instrument specific to these wounds. I would have suggested a metal object with a rounded edge. He's just murdered a co-worker he sat next to for months. He's covered in blood, some of it his own. But he still goes upstairs and steals those computers anyway. It's inconceivable. In the end, it was Kathy Marlowe's um, diligence um, to catch up with work that cost her her life. She was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. The defense concedes that Matthew went to research now intending to steal computers, but they insist he had nothing to do with Kathy's murder. Matthew's story is that it must have been his two accomplices, but his attorneys don't even try to present an alternate theory of what might have happened because there's no evidence that there was anyone else in that building. A massive hole in that story was that there was no sign of anybody else on the CCTV footage. He might have tried to claim that, oh, they, they snuck in and sort of got under the camera or they came into the building some other way, but, you know, it, it was never going to impress the jury. He didn't have any explanation whatsoever for his blood and hair being at the crime scene, and yet he insisted he hadn't hurt Kathy in any way. His defence is essentially to plead not guilty and hope the jury believe him. That doesn't usually work out very well. You know, you would have thought his defence might have said, well, let's try it for manslaughter, let's say it was all an accident or something. On September 30th, 2008, the court renders its decision. The jury retired for four and a half hours before returning a verdict of guilty, which was perhaps the only verdict they could return on the evidence against him. Fagan, he just came across as, you know, a bit of a loser. He'd been fired from his job for being essentially really bad at it. And then he thought he would steal some money from his old workplace. He made a very bad choice that day. He was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 26 years. Kathy's family were very pleased with the verdict. Clearly, nothing was going to bring Kathy back, but it had been a difficult time. They were clearly very happy that we'd achieved uh, the, the, the just outcome in this case. What should have been a story of two young people who both wanted to see the world instead turned into a horrifying tale of revenge gone wrong. It was quite a curiosity of the case that both the victim and the killer came from you know, the other side of the world. She'd come from New Zealand. He'd come from Oregon. And it just happened that they were in the same building at the same time and he felt that he had to kill her, which is, you know, a pretty cowardly thing to do. I think the real tragedy in this case is that Kathy Marlowe had travelled the world and gone to lots of places where there was lots of risk. On the day she was murdered, she was in a, what should have been a safe environment in a secure office complex, just catching up on some work. <laughs> 